the renegade mathematician here with a friendly warning this video contains a real mathematical proof so if you got the guts I would strongly recommend you follow along with a piece of paper a pencil or pen whatever and you pause the video as soon as you don't know what the hell I'm talking about so there you go proceed with caution Okay, now in the last video, uh, we had proved a corollary to Theorem 1 and Proposition 1, which says that uh, every permutation can be expressed as the product of one or more transpositions. Now, in this video, we're going to continue and, and uh, prove Theorem 2, which states that if the identity permutation, i, is expressed as a product of transpositions, then the number of transpositions in that product must be even, or... Another way of saying that is you can't express the identity permutation as a product of odd, of n odd number of transpositions. So let's go ahead and start that proof. Okay, suppose the contrary, that there exists some odd number of transpositions on the set 1 through n, and we'll call that um, those transpositions t1 through t sub m, such that the product of t sub 1 through t sub m is equal to the identity permutation. So basically what we're doing is assuming that's not true, right? That we that we can assemble some odd number of transpositions such that the product is the identity. Okay. Note that although it may not be apparent, our aim is to obtain a contradiction to the fact that no single transposition can be the identity permutation. We will do this by successively eliminating transpositions from the product t sub 1 through t sub m until we finally have a single transposition equal to i, the identity permutation, thereby affirming the opposite of what we have just now assumed, and that's because you can't have a single transposition uh, that is the identity permutation. That's impossible. Well, it's not a transposition, right? A transposition is where you take two entries in a permutation and then you switch them, right? Um, the identity doesn't move anything anywhere, so if you have a single transposition, you can't have the identity permutation. But anyways, we'll get there. Okay, moving on. Let x be any number appearing in one of the transpositions, any number, and let t sub k be the last transposition that x appears in. Okay. Then x must not appear after t sub k, because we just said it's the last transposition that x appears in. Okay. That is, x must not appear in t sub k plus 1, t sub k plus 2, t sub k plus 3, uh, t sub m. So x can't appear after that, right? t sub k is the last transposition where you'll see x. Okay. Consider the transposition t sub k minus 1 just before t sub k. There are four cases associated with t sub k minus 1. We will show that each case eventually results in the elimination of two transpositions from the product t sub 1 through t sub m, that big product. Okay, without loss of generality, let t sub k equal the transposition x a. Okay, here's case 1. Suppose that t sub k is equal to t sub k minus 1, right? So the transposition before it. Then we have, and do excuse the i maze here, but there are one, two, three equal signs here. Um, so the on the far left we have the um, the product of all the transpositions, t sub one all the way through t sub m, and then in the middle there I show t sub k minus one and t sub k. Okay, that is equal to, and then uh, we substitute xa for t sub k and t sub k minus 1. Okay. Now notice what I've uh, got boxed in here. These are the parts that I want you to focus in on. Those are the important parts. Okay, so instead of writing t sub k minus 1 and t sub k, I've written xa and xa because t sub k is equal to xa and t sub k minus 1 is supposed to be, in this case, the same as t sub k. But if I take the product of xa times xa, 
that will give me the identity permutation, right? The product that product of transpositions gives me an identity because the first transposition moves a to x, and then the second transposition moves x to a. So a goes to x, goes back to a, right? So that gives us the identity. And since it's the identity, we may as well remove it from that product. We may as well just not write it, right? And so on the far right, we've written that product without t sub k minus 1 and t sub k. Both factors are gone. Okay. Thus, the identity i can be written as a product of two fewer transpositions, t sub 1 through t sub m, but we're missing t sub k and t sub k minus 1 there, as you can see in the middle there, which would be equal to the identity. That's what we're assuming. <coughs> so that's case 1. Case 1 says that <coughs> if t sub k and the previous transposition, t, t sub k minus 1, are the same, then what we can do is we can just not write them. Like we just eliminate them from the product because they don't count for anything. Um, that's case one, at least. Now let's check out case two. Now suppose that x appears in t sub k minus 1, the transposition that's before t sub k, but t sub k minus 1 is not equal to t sub k, so they're different. x is in that transposition, but it's not exactly the same transposition as t sub k then we may let t sub k minus 1 equal the transposition xb, right, instead of xa, because it's supposed to be different, where b is not equal to x and b is not equal to a. Now, we can't let b be equal to x, because then we have the transposition bb, <laughs> which is not a transposition, right? Um, we can't let b be equal to a, because then we'd have t sub k equal to t sub k minus 1, which we're, we're assuming it's not that case, right? That's the first case, right? Okay, so now we have t sub k minus 1 times t sub k is equal to xb xa. All right. Since xb xa is equal to xa ab, as can be verified by examination, and you should do that. If that's not clear to you, what you should do is you should take those two products of transpositions and actually multiply them out and... and uh, show yourself that they're actually the same permutation, okay? So since the, transpo uh, the product of transpositions xb and xa is equal to the product of transpositions xa and ab, which you'll verify, I'm sure, then we must have t sub k minus 1 times t sub k equal to the product of transpositions xb times xa, which is equal to xa times ab. Thus, the identity is equal to that whole product of transpositions with uh, t sub k minus 1 and t sub k in the middle there. And uh, I've substituted in xa and ab on the right part of the equality. And we have modified the original product of transpositions so that the k minus 1 factor of the new product of transpositions is now the last factor in which x appears. Notice that when I take the product of transpositions xb and xa and I rewrite it as xa times ab, what I've done is I've moved x back to the left, right? So t sub k was the last factor that had x, and by taking that product and rewriting it in that way, I've now made the transposition before t sub k the last factor that has x. So I've messed with it so that it's no longer the last factor that has x. Okay, so now we're moving on to case three. So, but just to recap, case one, we got to eliminate two of the transpositions. Case two resulted in us moving x back a transposition, right? And case three, as you'll see, is similar to case two, but let's go for it. Suppose x does not appear in t sub k minus one, but a does. Then we may let t sub k minus one equal to c a, right, where c is not equal to x and c is not equal to a. So x appears in t sub k minus 1, but we don't have a in t sub k minus 1, okay? Now we have t sub k minus 1 times t sub k is equal to c a times x a. Now since c a times x a can be written, or is the same as, or is equal to, 
XC times AC as can be verified by examination, and you should, uh, then we must have T sub K minus 1 times T sub K is equal to CA times XA, which is equal to XC times AC. Okay, what have we done there? We've moved X back, right? X used to appear in T sub K. We messed with it. Now X appears in the one previous and not in T sub K at all anymore. We've moved it back. Thus the identity, blah, 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 blah. And we have modified the original product of transpositions so that the K minus 1th factor of the new product of transpositions is now the last factor in which X appears. We moved it back. Yeah. Okay, case four. We're getting close to finished. Now consider the case where neither x nor a appear in t sub k minus one. So it's a completely different transposition now. Okay? Then we may let t sub k minus one be equal to bc, where b isn't a, b is not x, c is not a, and c is not x. Otherwise, either we wouldn't have a transposition or we'd have one of the previous cases. So. So t sub k minus 1 is totally different than t sub k now. Now we have t sub k minus 1 times t sub k is equal to bc times xa, right? Since disjoint cycles commute, as we proved previously, then we must have bc times xa is equal to xa times bc. Oh my gosh, what have we done there? And t sub k minus 1 times t sub k must be equal to that product, xa times bc. Okay. Thus, the identity, which is equal to that product of all those transpositions, okay, uh, is equal to that product of transpositions where we've switched the two transpositions, t sub k and t sub k minus 1. We've switched them. And we have modified the original product of transpositions so that the k minus 1th factor of the new product of transpositions is now the last factor in which x appears. So here we are at case 4. Even if t sub k minus 1 is totally different than t sub k, I can still move x back to the transposition before it. So if t sub k is the last place that x appears, I can still move it back to the transposition before it. Now that's the last place that it appears. Okay. To recap, case 1 resulted in the elimination of t sub k minus 1 and t sub k from the product of t sub 1 through t sub m, while cases 2, 3, 4, and 5 result in the last factor in which x appears being shifted a factor to the left. Okay, we may continue the process of shifting that term to the left, but at some point we must have case 1, right, resulting in the elimination of two adjacent factors. Okay, if that's not really apparent to you, don't worry. To see why this is true, consider the following argument. If case 1 is never the case, uh, then we may eventually move x to the first transposition, right? So if, event, if we don't end up canceling, right, if we don't end up being able to eliminate two transpositions ever, then we just keep moving x over and over and over and over until eventually we're at the beginning, right? Um, and we will have xa times t sub 2 all the way through m. We moved x all the way to the first transposition, okay? With x not appearing in any of the transpositions, t2 through tm, this would imply that the identity of x right, is equal to xa times all the other transpositions, which would be equal to a, contradicting the fact that the identity of x should be equal to x by definition of the identity permutation, right? So, so because x only appears in the first transposition and it doesn't appear in any of the transpositions after that, that means that first transposition moves x somewhere and it never gets moved back, right? right? So that first transposition takes x, moves it to a, and it stays there, because there's, there's no other transposition that, that, that moves x anywhere, right? So then that would mean, that would imply that that product of transposition moves x to a, but that can't be the identity permutation, because the identity permutation moves x to x. It does nothing to it, right? It's supposed to put it where uh, it belongs, I guess. So that would contradict the fact that the identity permutation of x is supposed to be equal to x by definition of the identity permutation. Hence, we must eventually have case 1, right? So we assumed that 
well, suppose case one never happens. Well, then we have a contradiction. Okay, so case one has to happen. Eventually, we have, we'll move x, right? We'll keep moving x to the left, and then eventually we'll be able to say, aha, I can cancel two of those uh, transpositions. I can cancel two of them. That has to happen eventually. Okay. Thus, given any product of, odd, of an odd number of transpositions equal to the identity, that's t sub 1 through t sub m equal to i, we can eliminate two transpositions. Okay? The result is a product of m minus 2, that's another odd number, of transpositions equal to the identity, which means that we can eliminate 2 again, right? which once you take away two from that odd number, you have another odd number, so you can take away another two, et cetera, et cetera. So by continuing, this, uh, by continuing to eliminate transpositions two at a time, we eventually arrive at a single transposition equal to the identity, which is impossible, right? Therefore, the identity can't be written as a product of an odd number of transpositions. It has to be an even number, because if it's an odd number, then we can always cancel transpositions two at a time, eventually arriving at one transposition, which is a contradiction. So we have to have an even number of transpositions. Um, that's that. QED. Okay, so that's theorem two, which states that if the identity permutation i is expressed as a product of transpositions, then the number of transpositions in that product must be even, can't be odd, right? And next time, we'll go ahead and tackle the theorem 3. A permutation can't be written as one product of an odd number of transpositions. That is not the identity permutation, right? A permutation in general can't be written as one product of an odd number of transpositions and another product of an even number of transpositions. So it's either always odd or always even, right? Next time. See you then.